Uh, well, so first of all, uh, I, I want to really thank the organizers for the opportunity of talking today here. So thank you, Wol Wolfgang, Kat Katarina, and Ake for the nice opportunity. Uh, and also, of course, uh, I would like to thank all the uh, Spice Peace people that made the, this thing possible. <clears throat> so, so yeah, I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to be here and to have the opportunity of tell, telling you about this story today. Um, so, uh, as, as you know, I'm going to tell you about topological superconductivity because we are certainly in this session. And as we've heard in some wonderful talks before, there are many, many different materials and many, many, many different platforms to realize topological superconductivity nowadays. So we we have, for example, the different platform based on, on semiconductors for magnetic atomic chains. Even there are some materials that may be topological superconductors by themselves, like some iron-based superconductors or heavy fermion compounds. And we even have more recent examples based on topological insulators, like higher or, order topological insulators and two-dimensional materials. So the, the bottom line is that the more materials that we get for realizing topological superconductivity, uh, the more opportunities we have for, let's say, even controlling Majorana fermions and ultimately to uh, build a Majorana-based topological quantum computer. So the, the story that I want to tell you today is a story about how we can expand this family of topological superconductors even further. And in particular, how can we start using a new type of materials uh, in particular, how to start using anti-ferromagnetic insulators for uh, engineering artificial topological superconductivity. So the bottom line is that, uh, as you will know, there are many, many anti-ferromagnetic insulators in nature. And if we somehow find a way of realizing topological superconductivity with these compounds, we would have a really big uh, family of materials for realizing uh, topological superconductivity. So uh, to, to understand how we can use topological, insu uh, um, sorry, uh, anti-ferromagnetic insulators for uh, building a topological superconductor, let us recall what, what is the basic ingredient that we need for topological superconductivity. And this has been already mentioned several times in the previous talks, uh, but let me just uh, say it again, just to make it clear. So there are basically two main ingredients that we need for topological superconductivity. One of them is conventional S-wave superconductivity, and the other one is helical states. And we can get these helical states in many different ways. We can get them naturally from a topological insulator. We can engineer these helical states by combining rush, uh, rush resting orbit coupling, exchange fields in, in semiconductors, for example. Or we can just create some effective helical state just by combining some non-collinear magnetism uh, yeah, in a, in a system uh, in, in a system that it's on top of a superconductor. So the bottom line is that if you want to build your own superconductor, you first need to find your own way of creating these helical states. So that, that is the idea. That is what we need to get in an anti-ferromagnetic insulator to get topological superconductivity. We need to create helical states from an anti-ferromagnetic insulator. But uh, by definition of an anti-ferromagnetic insulator, we, we do not have helical states. The system is gapped. We have a finite, um, uh, there's a finite amount of energy that we have to pay to create uh, an excitation. So there's no helical state whatsoever. So this seems like a really deep problem, right? We, we want to get helical states, but by definition, the material with which we are trying to get them, it's just gapped everywhere and it's topologically trivial. So the question is, how are we going to, to solve th this critical problem? So this is the, the idea that I'm going to tell you today. And before going uh, to the story, let me first thank the people that made this story possible, in particular, uh, Manfred, Senna, and Pivey. And the story that I'm going to tell you today is essentially based on, on those three manuscripts that, that you see there. So essentially, what I'm going to tell you today is how we are going to exploit different kinds of anti magnets to get topological superconductivity. In particular, first time, I'm going to tell you about 3D anti magnets, 2D anti magnets, and uh, ultimately 1D anti magnets. And as I go down in dimension, I will also start putting more and more interaction effects. So at the beginning, there will be no interactions. Then I will show you what happens if you put interactions. And at the very end, I will show you what happens in a purely bending body limit. So let's go with the first story, which is how are we going to create a two-dimensional topological superconductor starting with a three-dimensional anti-ferromagnetic insulator? So the idea is fairly simple. We are going to say, all right, fine, let's, let's imagine that we take 
the right anti-ferromagnetic insulator, we put it on top of a conventional superconductor, and then some magic happens at the interface and we get a topological superconductor. So essentially we are going to consider a system that has kinetic energy, anti-ferromagnetism in the anti-ferromagnetic part, superconductivity in the superconducting part, and spin orbit coupling everywhere. So now the, the first thing that, that we need to solve is how we are going to create our helical states from the anti-ferromagnetic insulator, from the system that had a gap and had no helical states whatsoever. And the idea is actually very, very simple. And it's the following. So even if you have two insulators that both have a gap and both are topologically trivial, sometimes if you are lucky, you get interface states and you get interface states that are extremely robust. And one of the typical examples of this is uh, the so-called Jackie Rabai soliton, for example, that happens uh, or that it's realized in, uh, in warm nitride domain walls, for example. So here we are going to do the same idea. We are going to exploit the same idea. And the bottom line is that if you put the right anti-ferromagnet uh, connected to a generic superconductor, you are going to get zero modes, no matter what. No matter what it's the order parameter of your anti-ferromagnet, no matter what it's the magnitude of your superconducting gap, no matter what is the interface that you have, you're going to get them all the time. And that is the key thing. So I'm not going to enter into the details on how these modes emerge, but the important thing for you to remember is that if you take a gapped anti-ferromagnet that has direct gapped direct points, you are going to get these zero modes. So, so let's go to it. So let's look first at the band structure of a conventional anti-ferromagnet. There is a picture on the left that you see that it has a topologically trivial gap, so no edge states whatsoever. Then we look at a superconductor. It also has a gap coming from the superconducting gap, also no H whatsoever. And now when we make an interface between the topologically trivial anti-ferromagnet and the superconductor, we suddenly see that there are gapless edge modes in the gap. And as I told you before, no matter which parameters you take, no matter how you make the interface, as long as it is transparent, of course, you are going to get these zero modes there in your interface. Uh, and of course, these, these zero modes that you see in the interface are the Jackie Rabai like solitons that I told you before. And the bottom line is that these uh, solitons appear no matter what is the dimensionality of your anti-ferromagnet. So it appears in three dimensions, in two dimensions, and in one dimension. And here I'm just telling you about how it is in, in three dimensions, but I'm going to exploit the same idea uh, in, the, in the next parts of the talk. Good, so, so far we have our uh, solitons, our gapless states. So now the only thing that we have to do is we have to open a gap in them somehow. So now the idea is that if you switch on some small spin or recoupling, either in the anti-ferromagnet or in the superconductor or everywhere, these solitonic modes open up a gap. And this gap, it's actually topologically non-trivial and gives rise to a topological superconductor with a finite share number. Uh, and of course, since you have a topological superconductor with a finite share number, you're going to have your one-dimensional Majorana modes going around the, the edge of your, of your interface. So, so the, the, this is good and the, this is what we wanted. We have our topological superconductor, but now the question is, let's say, which kind of anti-ferromagnetic insulator do we have to take? Because I told you that you need some anti-ferromagnetic insulator that it's a little bit special. So the idea is that you need anti-ferromagnets whose electronic stru structure has gapped direct points. And you can find them in many different ways. So a, a simple way of finding these anti-ferromagnets is looking for systems that have anti-ferromagnetic uh, diamond lattices, for example, that you find in different materials called uh, spinels. And in particular, there's one material that it's cobalt aluminum to oxygen four that it's well known to be an anti-ferromagnetic diamond lattice. So this could be a possible candidate for getting uh, 2D topological superconductivity. And generically, you can start looking at materials that have direct lines in the paramagnetic state that become gapped in the, when they become anti-ferromagnetic. So now let me move on to, to the next part, which is how to create topological superconductivity in 2D and by exploiting interactions. So, so something that, that is in our minds is that to get uh, topological superconductivity, we usually need either spin orbit coupling or non-collinear magnetism, right? So I'm going to, to now try to see if we can get topological superconductivity without spin orbit coupling, without non-collinear magnetism, but including electronic interactions. So the basic idea that I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to focus on a 2D heterostructure that has a 2D anti-ferromagnetic insulator and a 2D superconductor. There's kinetic energy, there's anti-ferromagnetism, there's superconductivity, and now there's also repulsive interactions. 
And the fundamental question now is whether we can get topological superconductivity just by exploiting these repulsive interactions. So again, we have our interface between the anti and the superconductor. We have our solitons, which are the gapless states that you see in the picture on the right. And we have to somehow open a gap on these states. So the idea now is fairly simple, which is simply that if electronic interactions are capable of opening a gap in these uh, boundary modes, and if that gap is actually topological, so to do this, we introduce interactions that, uh, as a non-local Coulomb interaction. And since the system is two-dimensional and we cannot solve it exactly, we are going to use essentially a beam field ansatz to solve electronic interactions here. So we solve our, our model, uh, which is the, the picture on the right. So, so let me just explain you briefly. The picture on the left is the model without interactions for a finite ribbon in which we have the upper part and the lower part superconducting. And in, in that case, you see your gapless uh, states, which are the solitonic modes from before. And now when you introduce repulsive interactions, you see that a gap opens up the system. And if you uh, compute the topological invariant, you, you will see that the topological invariant is actually uh, non-zero and, and uh, essentially tells you that you have a topological superconductor. And the interesting thing is that if you now look at what is your mean field Hamiltonian here, actually what happened is that interactions created a uh, spin orbit coupling driven by interaction. So this is a synthetic spin orbit coupling that is driven purely by uh, repulsive interactions. So this is the, the first in interesting thing about uh, this model. Now there's another interesting thing, which is that uh, actually your topological gap can become really, really large and actually can saturate to the superconducting gap of your parent superconductor. So you, you may remember that from the uh, conventional uh, proposals for uh, topological superconductivity, usually the S-way superconducting gap is, let's say, an upper bound for your topological superconducting gap. Uh, in this case of a antiferromagnet with a superconductor, you can actually reach you can the maximum topological gap fairly easily, even if you put, let's say, uh, not too large Coulomb interactions in this model. And the last interesting thing about this model is that uh, this mode, the, this topological superconducting state appears at arbitrarily small repulsive interactions. So there's no critical value for having topological superconductivity in this model. Uh, and of course, you are going to have uh, zero modes associated to the to your topological superconducting state that are going to appear at the corners of your of your um, yeah of of a ribbon. Um, Katharina, how much time do I have left? Um, actually, I think you still have uh, 15 minutes, 16 minutes, something like that. Oh, all right, great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right, so the, now the, the last part uh, uh, would be, let's say, which materials uh, we, would, uh, we, we should take to get this two-dimensional topological superconductivity, uh, this one-dimensional topological superconductivity, sorry. And the, and the bottom line is that we need also two-dimensional antiferromagnets that have gapped Dirac equations. And, and this is going to, to happen generically on antiferromagnets that show a honeycomb lattice. And in particular, there are uh, several oxides that show uh, 2D honeycomb layers that are antiferromagnetic, like the, the indium and copper compounds that uh, you can see on the left. Uh, and then more generically, you can think that honeycomb lattices can also easily appear on two-dimensional van der Waals materials. Uh, the, the only uh, not optimal thing is that usually two-dimensional two van der Waals materials, uh, it's easy to get ferromagnets, whereas it, it's not that easy to, to get antiferromagnets, and especially the, the nil antiferromagnets that we are looking for here. But in particular, if you take certain uh, chromium halides and you apply some strain, you can drive them, them into the antiferromagnetic state, which is the one that you would need for this proposal. So th this is everything that I wanted to tell you about topological superconductivity. And now I'm going to, to go towards something perhaps a, a little bit deeper and a little bit perhaps harder to understand, which is how ex many body excitations appear between quantum antiferromagnets and superconductors. And this is inspired by the emergence of solitons that we saw before. So, so let me explain you uh, why this is kind of different from before. So, so far, I was telling you that we were using antiferromagnets and the kind of 
antiferromagnet that I was referring to is the conventional Neil antiferromagnet. So a system that breaks time reversal symmetry and has a stagger magnetization. So your, if you, let's say, apply time reversal symmetry to your system, you get something that it's different from the initial system that you have before. And this is what is usually called mean field antiferromagnet, classical antiferromagnet. But now if you have a quantum many body Hamiltonian that has, let's say, antiferromagnetic couplings, your uh, ground state actually doesn't break time reversal symmetry, especially if you are in one dimension. Uh, and the simplest example of this is the case of, let's say, a spin singlet, when you have two spin one half that are coupled antiferromagnetically, uh, uh, so in, in that case, your ground state is essentially in spin zero that doesn't break time reversal symmetry. So now the, the idea is what happens if we take one of these quantum antiferromagnets, especially a one-dimensional quantum antiferromagnet, and we put it in contact with a superconductor. So uh, to, to study this problem, we are essentially going to, to also include uh, kinetic energy, superconductivity, and interactions. And now, since we want to study a purely many-body problem, we need to solve it with a purely many-body method. And we are lucky that for one dimension, there's one way of doing this, uh, which is the tensor network formalism that essentially allows us to, to access all the ground state properties and all the excitations and everything that, that you can imagine. So essentially, we are going to solve a one-dimensional system that consists on a superconductor and a quantum antiferromagnet, and we are going to see uh, how the, the spectrum of this model is. So let, let's start with, with something easy. So let's look first at a 1D superconductor and then let's look at a 1D quantum antiferromagnet. So for the uh, superconductor, we have, all, we have a gap in our density of states, which is uh, the typical gap that we we'll expect from, from the pairing that we are putting essentially by hand at the beginning. And then on the antiferromagnet, we also have a gap on our density of states, which is, which is essentially the Hubbard gap. So the gap that comes from the uh, electronic cor correlations from the repulsive electronic correlation that we put on our system. And you see again that both systems have a, a gap. So the superconductor has the superconducting gap, the quantum antiferromagnet has the mod gap. And now again, when we put together the superconductor and the quantum antiferromagnet, we see that gapless excitations appear at the interface almost at, at zero energy. And also the, the remarkable thing here is that Again, no matter which superconducting order parameter you choose, no matter which repulsive interaction you choose, no matter how you make the interface, this in-gap mode stays always there. So this mode is as robust as the solitonic mode that you saw before, with the remarkable difference that now this is a purely many-body problem. So we, we actually cannot solve this analytically. This is just a numerical solution that we got from the tensor network formalism. So the question is whether we can understand this mode and we, whether we can actually relate this mode to something that we know from before. So, so to do that, let, let us first go one step back and assume that we have a, an interface between a 1D superconductor and a 1D classical antiferromagnet, a 1D uh, mean field antiferromagnet. So the kind of single particle Hamiltonian that we usually like. So in this case, we again have a zero mode which is the solitonic zero mode that I told you at the very beginning, right? So, and if you compare, let's say the, this picture here, which is the purely many body one with this one here, which is the single particle one, well, they, they actually look pretty similar. So perhaps they are related to each other. So let's try, let's try to do this. Let's try to see if we can actually connect the two solutions, the many body solution and the single particle solution. Uh, and, and to do that, we can, just simply define a Hamiltonian that has both superconductivity, stagger antiferromagnetism and interactions. So in one limit, we can say that we only have interactions so that we have the purely quantum many body solution. In the other limit, we, we have stagger antiferromagnetism. So we go to the classical solution and we can essentially interpolate all the spectra between these two limits. So on the panel on the left, you see, for example, how the stagger magnetization evolves with the, uh, yeah, with the uh, stagger antiferromagnetism that you put by hand, and you see that when it's zero, you essentially have a quantum antiferromagnet. When it's non-zero, you essentially have a stagger antiferromagnet. And then on the right, we see you see essentially a sketch of how the interface excitations are. So the bottom line is that when you are in the symmetry broken state, you essentially have one single excitation that corresponds to your soliton. Whereas when you are in the in the many-body case that does not break 
timbre basalt symmetry, you have simultaneously two excitations. And you can actually explicitly compute this uh, by solving the, the previous Hamiltonian from before with the tensor network formalism and looking at how the spectral function is at the, inter at the interface. So you see that at the interface, you have at finite uh, stacker magnetization, a zero mode, that is the original solitonic mode that we could solve analytically. And then as you go to the quantum many body limit, this uh, zero mode merges with the other zero mode that, uh, that comes from the opposite stacker magnetization. So you end up with two modes uh, when your system is purely quantum many body and doesn't break time result symmetry. And then you see that uh, as you have made this interpolation between the single particle and the many body limit, nothing remarkable happened to the spectral function of your anti parameter So you have a mod gap all the time. The only difference is that in some case you break the result symmetry and in other case you, you do not. So now the last point is, uh, well, it, what would be the, let's say the right system to try to realize uh, this kind of phenomena, in particular to try to realize this one dimensional quantum anti magnetism And of course you can find also bulk compounds that have one dimensional uh, quantum change, but perhaps uh, a platform that it's uh, pretty good to explore this kind of physics is one dimensional spin chains, uh, which in particular one could uh, create a one dimensional quantum spin chain that it's in close proximity to a superconductor and explore the emergence of these quantum many body excitations. Um, so with this, uh, I would like to just, just to tell you that uh, the, only, the most important thing to remember is that uh, anti-ferromagnetic superconductor junctions are a very interesting platform for realizing uh, solitons, topological superconductivity with major bound states, and more generically, robust many-body excitations. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to your questions.